Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on physical health. Um, we have five fantastic speakers for you today. Unfortunately, we only have 90 minutes for them all. So everybody will have 15 minutes for their presentation if they have time. Uh, within that 15 minutes, we'll take questions. Um, if not, we'll, uh, it, if there's no time for questions, um, within that 15 minutes, we'll, we'll be moving on to the next speaker. And at the end, we'll field questions as time allows. So hold on to any questions you have. <laughs> and we'll try to get to them at the end. So my, my name, by the way, is Susan Azrin. Um, I am at the NIMH. I'm in the Division of Services and Interventions Research. And I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, which will be Dr. Josh Breslau from the RAND Corporation. And his talk is titled, Effectiveness of Mental Health-Based Strategies for Improving Physical Health Care for Adults with SMI. Thank you. Um, I think I took the word effectiveness out of my title here on the slide, but <laughs> but that was a mistake because I think actually effectiveness is uh, and efficacy versus effectiveness is very much a, a theme uh, that uh, we're th thinking a lot about um, and is motivating a lot of this research and thinking about how to move uh, how to improve services uh, on a system wide basis um, for some issues that um, we are all very uh, familiar with and um, so. I want to start with uh, mentioning my collaborators. A couple of them are here. Marcella is, is here, also working with uh, some colleagues at RAND. And this project is done in close collaboration with uh, people in the Office of Mental Health from New York State. And Molly Finnerty is in the audience as well. Um, and uh, we have another, a number of other uh, collaborators from there. And I should also mention that we are funded by uh, NIMH um, for this work. Um, I don't think I need to convince people here about the need for improving uh, physical health care for people with serious mental illness. Um, I think uh, actually Marcella uh, wrote an outstanding article, a broad article, that uh, in 2006 on, on uh, the, the broad issues around integrating uh, and improving mental health care, uh, physical health care for people with serious mental illness. Um, there has been very good uh, mental health services research uh, in this area since the early 2000s. Um, and really, the, I think the biggest uh, national push really started uh, around um, 2009 with SAMHSA's funding of uh, the primary behavioral health care uh, integration grants, um, specifically focusing on um, provision of uh, primary care services or more generally treatment of physical health conditions in specialty mental health care. So I think that's, it's important to think of that as one of the uh, many strategies that we have for uh, improving care in this area. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that we can improve uh, quality of care, and I'm gonna be talking about quality in particular today. Um, we uh, improving quality by providing adults with serious mental illness a new uh, way to access uh, care for their physical health conditions. Um, we know from <clears throat> uh, randomized control trials, uh, mostly done by uh, Ben Druss, but uh, that this uh, strategy can be effective. There were some early studies in integrated care systems, but you know, maybe it's easier to do this in integrated care systems. There are also some uh, randomized trials in, then in um, community mental health centers, which I think is, you know, really the, where the, our focus if for, uh, if we want to reach uh, the broader SMI population needs to be. Um, and there too, there was uh, success in improving quality of, uh, of care for chronic conditions. Um, but, uh, the question then, or one of the questions becomes, you know, how do we uh, go beyond the conditions of a randomized trial uh, with a single setting uh, to really try to uh, see if we can get change, improvement in quality on a system-wide uh, basis. Um, so uh, I think 
in doing that, moving from randomized trials to issues of effectiveness, uh, I think what we're going to be looking for is incremental advances in how a system treats people with SMI rather than replication of a model program, and can, can these results be replicated across a whole, uh, a whole state, for instance, for instance, like New York State where we did our work. Now, it's important to think before getting into this why it might not work, because it sounds pretty convincing that all we have to do is provide care in specialty mental health for people with serious mental illness, and we're going to obviously uh, improve the quality of that care. And I think it's important for policy to think, for think the policy research to think about why that might not work. Um, it might not work because we duplicate services. Uh, for we, we provide more primary care services to people, that sec segment of the SMI population that's already receiving uh, care for their chronic uh, conditions. So we're not actually reaching that portion of the target population that has the greatest need. So we might be duplicating rather than filling a gap. We might be overestimating the role of access and quality disparities. That is, there are other uh, factors that contribute to uh, poor quality care that uh, are not <coughs> simply give somebody access and, and they get quality care. We uh, are, may, there may be variation in the, we know there is variation across uh, areas, across states, within states, across counties, across systems, et cetera, in the quality of care that people are already getting. And if we're providing services in places where, or adding services in places where care is already uh, high, uh, then we may not see, uh, see the changes that we want. Again, kind of missing, missing the target. Um, another issue to consider, physical health conditions that occur, that in adults with serious mental illness who have uh, not only, often have multiple physical health conditions as well as serious mental illness may not be uh, appropriately treated in, by the level of primary care services or physical health services that can be provided effectively in a, uh, a mental health setting. Um, so can we uh, really provide that, that level of intensity uh, for, for this population? Other uh, workforce issues, we know there are in, in many parts of the country huge barriers uh, in terms of workforce for primary care. Are we, by opening up, trying to open up a new setting for primary care, already uh, placing additional stress or expecting that somehow uh, you know, that, that the existing workforce shortage is not going to impose limits on, on what we can do? So there are a lot of reasons to think about why this might not actually pan out the way um, uh, we think it might. Um, I want to talk about briefly about some prior work that we did. Um, this was in connection with the uh, primary care behavioral, the, the PBHCI uh, evaluation that we did for the uh, Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation of DHHS. And we looked at um, PBHCI clinics, clinics that had received PBHCI grants in three different states. Uh, and we looked uh, using difference and difference model at what the impact of uh, those of those clinics receiving the grants was on uh, the quality on these quality measures uh, here on a variety of quality measures related to the quality of physical health care diabetes monitoring flu vaccination breast cancer screening etc. Um, and what we found was somewhat disappointing. Um, we found. Uh, is so in some uh, some cases no effect at all. We found some kind of isolated, kind of spotty, positive uh, effects on quality. Um, so diabetes monitoring in one cohort in one state, um, and we also found some places where there was evidence that quality was going down. Um, and so we really have are starting to see that this. Uh, there is some potential here. Sometimes we're seeing positive effects, but it's certainly not a, a slam dunk. And this, this PBHCI, to remind you, these are grants that are given to clinics to uh, directly to improve uh, these services. So to not see these kinds of uh, improvements in quality is really something that's, that's notable. Um, the, the studies that um, I'm gonna be talking about here uh, are both in New York, are both in New York State. 
Uh, one is a PB, PBH, study of PBHCI, so a grant-funded, kind of gold-plated program. The other is a Medicaid reimbursement strategy, which uh, we refer to as health monitoring health physicals, which is a very, very simple change to the reimbursement schedule for specialty mental health clinics in New York State that simply allowed them to start billing and be reimbursed for some basic physical health services, something very, the, in a sense, the opposite end of the spectrum from PBHCI in terms of the intensity of the intervention. Um, the PBHCI results, which we have published, um, kind of tell us the same thing as we saw from the, in the, the prior evaluation, which is that we don't see really a lot of uh, big increases, big improvements in quality of care um, in, in the PBHCI clinics. And where we saw the improvement, where we saw the improvement was in the monitoring of uh, patients who are on antipsychotics. So, which you can really think of as, you know, in a sense, the low-hanging fruit here. This is, these are people who, uh, people who are known already, this is a, a, really a, a side effect of their psychiatric treatment. Um, and that's the area where the PBHCI program seems to have had an effect, um, but no, without, but in terms of going beyond that, in terms of improving quality of care for, uh, for other, uh, other conditions, uh, we don't see, um, we're just not observing. Um, the health monitoring, health physicals program by contrast. Um, so clinics signed up, so all they had to do was go online and, and sign up for uh, this program. It allowed them to provide health monitoring or health physicals. Health monitoring is really just routine um, test to assess status of physical health conditions. Physical, if the health physical is just an annual exam. And there's enormous interest among clinics, and I think everybody probably knows this. There's enormous interest among clinics in providing these kinds of services. And that's reflected in the fact that 58% of the clinics, of the 500 specialty mental health clinics in New York State, signed up. And those clinics collectively serve a total of 62% of the Medicaid mental health clinic population. So really able, in theory, to reach the majority of the people who are treated in specialty mental health settings uh, in uh, the public mental health settings in, in New York State. Of the freestanding clinics, which I think these are kind of the most important targets for us, so there are 300 in New York, um, they serve, we were a 54%, so about the same. Um, and we can really think of the freestanding clinics as having the greatest challenge. So freestanding as opposed to hospital affiliated. So these are clinics that don't have existing relationships necessarily with uh, larger uh, health care institutions. So that was the, um, the clinics that enrolled. When we look at what actually happened in terms of the services, so we look at the billing data on what actually happened what in those clinics, what kinds of services uh, did they deliver over the first 12 months of enrollment? Um, here in uh, figure one, uh, most people who got a, one of these services got exactly one service over 12 months, although there were some uh, who, who um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, figure, um, figure one is for the clinics. This is the, the number of these services that the clinics that enrolled provided. And what we see is that they really did not, were not able to provide very many of them. In fact, the, um, the median is here, well, I'm not showing up on the slide, um, is, in the, is in the 20s in term, over a course of a year. Um, and uh, among those, the, in terms of the, and this side is the number of services per person. So um, the, the number of, um, so again, the enormous variation in the uh, number of, um, I think it's, well, I'm gonna move on. I only have a minute and a half. Um, so what we looked at, given this wide variation, I apologize for that, given the wide variation in implementation, we wanted to look at the, uh, we wanted to look at the impact of the program. 
we wanted to look at, we decided rather than to look at it uh, just in terms of one number, to try to look at it in three different ways. We want to look at it um, uh, with three different models. One is as treated, where we compare people who got the service to other people in the same clinic who did not get the service. Per protocol, which is people who got the service compared to people in clinics that did not provide the service. And then the intent to treat, which is um, comparing the entire clinic population for the HMHP clinics to the non-HMHP clinics. And let me show you the results. The uh, as-treated analysis, we see positive effects on our three quality measures, that is uh, blood glucose screen and cholesterol screen for people on antipsychotics and um, for diabetes uh, monitoring. Um, similar for the per protocol analysis, but when we look at the intent to treat analysis, which is really the, uh, what is the effectiveness model here, we do not see any uh, overall clinic level uh, impact of the program. Um, I'm running out of time. Uh, and um, let me stop there. <laughs> um, I can, I, so, uh, conclusions. So, for people who receive the service, so uh, I think we are seeing that it can improve their quality of care. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive, this, the Medicare program. It, it's a tweak to the reimbursement schedule. It's inexpensive on a system-wide basis where you actually see some impact that's kind of in the same range uh, as what we saw with PBHCI. Um, but it's really not enough. Uh, and in terms of uh, the efficacy, we're not, uh, not seeing that, uh, that the broad level uh, change in quality that we'd like to see. Thank you, Josh. So our, our next speaker will be Dr. Leo Cabasa from Washington University, St. Louis. And let's see if we can advance. Oh, why don't you bring your, sure. your slides up? Right. And Dr. Cabasa's talk is entitled Correlates of Physical Activity and cardio-respiratory fitness among diverse people with SMI. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Oh, and the 15 minutes are right there. Wow. All right. Buenos dias. Good morning, people. All right. Thank you so much for joining this panel, uh, and we'll make this quick, actually. So <laughs> part of what we're trying to do here is going to use data from an ongoing randomized control trial that we're doing uh, for people with serious mental illness who are um, uh, overweight and obese, and we're using baseline data to examine uh, what's related to their physical activity, as you will see through several measures, and their cardiorespiratory fitness, which is basically the ability of the circulatory system uh, and respiratory system to provide oxygen to, the, to muscles as people are doing physical activity. And we did this through a six-minute walking test, and you'll see uh, sort of what we found. Uh, so before I begin, this is part of a larger trial. This is the team of people who've been involved in this project for the past four years. It's a great team. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, and it involves not only professionals, but also peer specialists who are delivering our intervention. Uh, and it's been a great journey uh, thus far uh, to this project. So as you know, people with serious mental illness are dying much younger than the rest of the population, between 13 to 30 years, depending on the type of data that you use and, and study as you look. Uh, and it's mostly due to cardiovascular disease. And in our project, we're really focusing both on weight and physical activity uh, as part of the multiple constellation of risk factors that people have. And there's many different things that influence the health of people with serious mental illness. Uh, and in our project, we're looking at those health behaviors, what people do, what they eat, how much they engage in physical activity or not, uh, and how to help them with that. Um, so for the purpose of this talk, we are examining some variables that we are collecting that focuses on very specific independent cardiovascular risk factor, which are related to your sedentary behavior, which all of you are engaging right now, which is sitting down, <laughs> and, and, and that's a major sedentary behavior, and that's some of the things that we uh, measure. The lack of physical activity, which you're also engaging right now, 
uh, of not actually walking or doing other uh, more moderate or vigorous activity, and then cardiorespiratory fitness uh, as another component uh, of a risk factor. And all of these are independently related to cardiovascular disease in one way or another. Uh, so there's major alarming trends in the physical activity and CRF of people with SMI. People with SMI are more sedentary than the general population, usually three hours more sedentary per day. They engage in significantly less moderate to vigorous physical activity uh, and have high significant reduced CRF compared to age or uh, sex match control, even when you also control for different types of psychiatric disorders. And there's some interesting systematic lit reviews that have examined each of these behaviors. Uh, that, have, that have been published in the recent years, really uh, examining some of these uh, trends and comparing people with serious mental illness and the general population or healthy controls. Uh, but there's, serious, there's some gaps that we've identified. One, a lot of these studies use small clinical samples of people who've been treated, usually within a system of care. A lot of these studies have been conducted outside of the United States, Canada, Australia, the Netherlands, uh, and not a lot of research in, have included diverse population, racial and ethnic diverse population, particularly one that, that we serve here in the United States. And some have examined limited number of correlates. There's a few exceptions to, that, to those gaps, but that's in general what we have sort of began to identify in this literature. So we wanted to address this gap with some of the data that we have. So the purpose of this study was to examine and report basically uh, this, this cardiovascular risk factors, certain entire behavior, lack of physical activity, and cardiorespiratory fitness within our sample, and then examine a correlate, a series of correlate demographic, mental health, health, and health agency, which means basically your self-efficacy or health locus of control. Uh, so as I mentioned, we use data from the peer-led Healthy Lifestyle Pro in Supportive Housing, which is a large a hybrid one study assessing the effectiveness and examining the implementation of a peer-led healthy lifestyle intervention. We have three major community partners, uh, uh, which are supportive housing agencies, two in Philadelphia, one in New York City, and all of our sample are people with serious mental illness who are overweight or obese, a BMI of 25 or above. Um, we basically are, are enrolled sample is 314, uh, and it, this is the data we're gonna be using for today, uh, today's presentation. Uh, so the baseline measures and the measure of interest for this analysis are the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, which is a self-report measure, and we're examining three basic components here. We're examining seating minutes per day, uh, walking minutes per week, and the percentage that have engaged in at least 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous activity. This is a self-report measure, uh, so there's some issues with the measure that I'm happy to talk uh, in the Q&A. Uh, for the cardiorespiratory fitness, we use the six-minute walking test, which is a simple measure that basically is that. You put someone to walk for six minutes in a specific area, and you measure how much uh, they've actually walked in the meters walk. And then we had a series of correlates, demographic, mental health, health, and mental health agency. Uh, agency. Uh, we did descriptive analysis and as well as multivariate analysis, depending on whether we're using uh, continuous or categorical variable for our independent measure. These the, uh, walking minutes per week, we had to use a log transformation because it was highly skewed, uh, so we corrected for that skew with the log transformation. So what did we found? So overall, our sample, as you can see here, uh, it's a, a little bit half uh, female. We have a majority uh, racial and ethnic minority, particularly African Americans. Uh, the health conditions, these are self-reported health conditions, hypertension and high cholesterol uh, are pretty prevalent, and we have uh, lots of people with uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and depression, which are typical to the population being served in the supportive housing agencies. In terms of our model for seating, uh, people uh, were sitting about nine point hours per day uh, uh, spent seating, and what we found was older people sat more than younger people, people with perceived health, uh, uh, that was negative related to your sitting time, diabetes was positively related to your sitting time, and hypertension was negatively uh, uh, related to your, to your sitting time. In terms of walking, people were walking about 5.9 hours per week, uh, and we saw several relationships, uh, female uh, walking less than men, people with schizophrenia walking less than people who have, uh, didn't have schizophrenia. If you have a good health quality of life by the SF12, uh, you walk more, and then positive relationship with self-efficacy, self-efficacy for exercise and health locus of control. Uh, in terms of engaging in moderate to rigorous activity, 34% of our sample engaged in 150 minutes or more uh, of moderate to rigorous activity. We didn't find uh, any, any demographic components there. Here was uh, some interesting findings. Uh, the higher the level of symptoms you have on the basis 24, the more likely, or the higher odds you had 
uh, for actually engaging in moderate to figure activity. If you have arthritis, we also found a positive relationship with that. And similar to walking agency, health agency was positively related to engaging in moderate to vigorous activity. Uh, in terms of cardiorespiratory fitness, on average, our participants were walking 360 meters, converting that into feet. It's around uh, 1,000 feet. Uh, older were walking less than younger. Uh, people with bipolar disorder uh, tended to walk more than people without. BMI was negatively associated with the meters that you walk, uh, and your health-related quality of life uh, was positively uh, 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 related to uh, the amount of meters that you walk on the six-minute walking test. So what does this all mean? So basically, when we compare, to put things into perspective in context, when we compare our, our sample with general population estimates in the literature, what we're finding is that our sample is more sedentary than the general population. It's tended to be less active and have poor cardiorespiratory fitness compared to what's been reported there in, uh, in healthy controls, indicating that physical activity and cardiorespiratory fitness are critical elements in our sample. Uh, and these are people who have engaged or enroll in a randomized control trial about these issues. So it makes sense in many ways that this is things that they want to work on or are interested in working on. In terms of the other finding, what we're finding is that female and other participants could benefit from physical activity uh, intervention, particularly in our sample. This seems to be the populations that tend to uh, may need more attention around these issues. We found a complex and mixed association with mental health. Uh, in some instances, having schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, uh, was associated with less walking, less physical activity. But having more symptoms and having bipolar disorder was associated with engaging in more rigorous and vigorous activity. Uh, so we're st still trying to figure out that finding. And there's some things, some ideas that we're coming up, and I'm happy to talk to, uh, to you about that in the Q&A or what that might be happening. Overall, better, better health was associated with more, being more active uh, and better CRF, although there were some ex exceptions. And self-efficacy and health locus of control were consistently related to um, it's an important target for physical activity and cardiorespiratory fitness. These are important elements. Uh, those, those people who are reporting more self-efficacious uh, and have internal locus of control towards their health tended to engage in more physical activity. And this is our baseline uh, level. So in terms of limitation, this is our preliminary findings in many ways. We use self-reported measures for physical activity and several correlates. And that's a real issue when you're doing physical activity. People underestimate or overestimate their physical activity depending on what you're asking them. So it's a critical issue to use objective measures. It's a cross-section analysis. So what we're seeing here is the relationship between these variables. We need more uh, prospective studies, and uh, we will have opportunities to do that in our sample as we're following people for 18 months. It's a non-random sample. These are people who enroll in a randomized controlled trial. Even if we're doing this in the community, this is a select group of individuals who met that criteria and went through the entire process. So they don't met, represent uh, the clients at this clinic. And there are other important factors that we're not considering, particularly psychiatric medications. We have that data. Uh, we're in the process of actually coding that data. Uh, but that's an important element to examine the relationship between taking psychiatric medication, the type of psychiatric medications that you're taking, and the impact that that may be having in engaging in physical activity and your cardiorespiratory fitness. So in terms of where we're taking this next, we need more uh, prospective studies to identify not only these risk and protective factors, but the pathways by which these factors influence the health and the well-being of people with serious mental illness. And we are in the process, actually, of uh, developing some of those models. Uh, for example, we're doing a paper right now where we're trying to figure out the impact that uh, physical activity has on the health-related quality of life of people. Is it through your BMI? Is it through your CRF to understand what aspects uh, and what, how that relationship impact quality of life? And we're in the process, this is a randomized controlled trial, so our next step is actually to test the impact of this peer-led healthy intervention, not only on weight, but also on cardiorespiratory fitness and physical activity to examine the impact that this uh, engaging in this intervention will have. Uh, and we will have the opportunity to test uh, that impact compared to usual care in these clinics. Uh, before I begin, I do want to uh, uh, mention one of our great colleagues, who's one of our great colleagues last year, uh, who passed away during uh, the course of this study. Uh, her dedication to this, to this project, her, her passion to this work is an inspiration for us, and uh, we dedicate sort of everything that we're doing for this work to the memory of Kelly Adams, uh, 
who was a champion for the health of people with serious mental illness and who really uh, uh, touched our lives and touched many of the lives of the participants in our project. Thank you. Any questions? I have three minutes. <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi, Gail. Yeah. Especially in this population, even the six-minute walk is, you know, volitional. There's this kind of volitional component to it. Yeah. And I wonder if you've looked to see whether they would like if someone has self, high self-reported physical activity, if their six-minute walk at baseline is also higher, sedentary behavior lower. Things yeah. Like that. That's a great suggestion. I don't think we, we began to explore some of it, but I don't have any findings to report on, on that component. Uh, we know there, there's serious e issues with the IPAC. I mean, and actually the IPAC is not supposed to be a measure, a clinical measure actually of outcomes. Uh, and we, are, uh, we used it in certain ways around that. There's major issues to reporting. But I think it's important to look at the interrelationship. And actually the model that we're building right now of examining the relationship of physical activity and BMI and physical activity and CRF uh, will be an important aspect because I think there will be, the, the, I mean, the, in theory, physical activity should influence your cardiorespiratory fitness, which right. then influence right. your health. But to examine whether there's any relationship, I, th I think it will be very important. Yeah. That's great. Maybe we'll combine our data. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason we use them. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you looking at or measuring the potential role of sleep apnea in this population? No, we're not. That's a great question. We, we don't have any sleeping measures, uh, but that, I think that would be an important component to that, given that our population is, has chronic medical illnesses as well but BMI, uh, obese and obe uh, overweight and obese uh, as an important component. Yeah. All right, thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Marcella Horvitz Lennon from the Rand Corporation. And her talk is entitled The Effects of Race, Ethnicity, and Cardiometabolic Morbidity on Antipsychotic Overuse Among Publicly Insured Adults. So, Good morning, uh, buenos dias, following Leopoldo, <laughs> Leo's uh, uh, initiative uh, to be bilingual here. Um, I appreciate your interest uh, in, in this uh, area and in, in these topics. Um, and my uh, talk this morning um, has um, touches upon some of the, um, the themes that uh, we've been discussing in the previous uh, talks. Um, I was uh, extremely inspired this morning um, listening to uh, Judge uh, Leifman uh, talk about the uh, troubles, the difficulties that uh, we have had as a society to bring what we know works to the community um, and uh, provide uh, good uh, uh, quality care to um, our population. Um, this uh, talk um, pertains to um, an often, um, uh, th there's less attention being paid to overuse uh, as, a, as an issue in terms of providing good quality care. We tend to think about um, problems with underuse, uh, underusing evidence-based practices, which is a huge uh, problem, a huge uh, driver of low quality care. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll be uh, uh, discussing uh, research that has been focusing on 
um, overuse of services and how that might impact people with serious mental illness. Um, oh. So that's my outline, and uh, let me just jump right in. My um, uh, research team um, includes uh, my co-PI, Shirley Norman, who's not been able to uh, attend this uh, conference, um, multiple other um, um, team members uh, that have been extremely uh, critical to the um, uh, accomplishments in this uh, research project. Um, so um, um, you are probably aware um, that um, when we talk about serious mental illness, we tend to refer to schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, uh, particularly bipolar one, and um, a, a severe form of depression, um, uh, major depressive disorder. Um, a um, form of depression, of major depressive disorder that does not respond to antidepressants um, or regular uh, treatment, um, I will refer to it as treatment resistant um, uh, major depressive disorder, MDD. And those are the three only indications for the use of antipsychotics in adults. So starting with um, a uh, sort of staking out what is the role of um, antipsychotics, a, um, a, a drug class um, that, um, as it name, uh, its name implies, is primarily um, uh, aiming at uh, controlling psychotic symptoms. Um, while all um, antipsychotics in, um, available in the U.S. are approved for schizophrenia, only a subset of them have FDA approval for the treatment of bipolar 1 disorder and, and even a smaller subset for people with treatment-resistant uh, major depressive disorder. Um, however, we know, um, and actually uh, I was on the news this morning, um, uh, that um, uh, children have been um, treated with antipsychotics uh, in an off-label manner. Um, uh, and this is not just something that happens to children. Uh, it happens uh, with adults and seniors. Um, and uh, when um, there's off-label use of um, medications, what that means is that the prescriber is uh, treating uh, a condition for which the Food and Drug Administration uh, has not uh, provided a stamp of approval in terms of the strength of the evidence of efficacy um, and safety for, uh, for that particular treatment. Um, so uh, antipsychotics are frequently used off-label, um, and the conditions for which they are most commonly used uh, in this manner include uh, what you see there, anxiety disorders, post-traumatic stress disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, dementia, and intellectual disability, which I will refer to as cognit cognitive disorders. The off-label use of antipsychotics has uh, exploded since uh, second-generation antipsychotics, uh, which um, uh, I um, use the acronym SGAs to refer to, uh, hit the U.S. market in the 1990s, and uh, thereafter, a number of new SGAs have entered the uh, market, and uh, with each entry, there's been um, an expanding use of, of these medications for these other conditions. Um, many, um, so, so um, the other element, other than the fact that they are used uh, frequently off-label, is that they are costly. The use of, the off-label use of uh, SGAs is uh, costly. And uh, by that, I mean that um, the purchasing costs are high. They tend to be higher than uh, for the um, older uh, so-called first-generation antipsychotics um, as, a, as a class. Um, and um, uh, this is partly because many of them are still uh, in uh, brand uh, only, um, as, uh, offered as brand only products, uh, but also because the pharmaceutical companies have 
um, been fairly active at repositioning them, that is, um, uh, marketing them for other indications, and uh, also reformulating uh, the products. Uh, and each of these uh, changes uh, uh, sort of extends the patent and uh, uh, means that they uh, remain uh, costly to the system. The other element to the high costs associated with these medications is that um, they are associated with a variable but fairly high, uh, generally high as a class, risk for weight gain and cardiometabolic conditions, um, which I will refer to also as cardiometabolic morbidity. Um, these include diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and um, uh, other uh, cardiometabolic morbidities such as uh, stroke. And um, as we know, uh, these conditions require, uh, you typically are chronic, disabling, and uh, the healthcare system, um, uh, uh, the, the healthcare uh, provided to these individuals is costly, and thus uh, the healthcare system uh, confronts high costs associated to that care. Um, because of all this, um, uh, off-label um, SGA use uh, is an example of overuse in healthcare. Um, overuse has been defined in various ways, but um, I, I think a good way to think of it is the use of services that at best um, uh, imply inefficient use of scarce resources, particularly for the public healthcare system. And at worst, uh, there, the potential for harm exceeds uh, the likely benefit. And this is very important um, because of the following. When a person with schizophrenia is treated with an antipsychotic, there is an assessment of risk and benefit, um, where the benefit uh, will most likely exceed the risk for that patient because this person is likely to benefit from the drug. When the medication is used off-label, um, there's uh, no, the, uh, the implication is that there's no um, good evidence that the benefits uh, are there, and uh, hence the potential, potential for harm uh, is most likely exceeding that likely uh, or unlikely benefit. Um, and, and the uh, last point uh, in this regard is that um, uh, overuse of SGAs uh, uh, is a significant burden to public payers, um, the largest of which are Medicaid and Medicare. Um, why? Uh, because public payers are likely to finance the healthcare related to um, cardiometabolic morbidity arising from uh, the uh, overuse of these medications. Um, and public payers also finance a large share of the health care of people with mental illness um, and racial ethnic minorities. Um, and both people with serious mental illness and uh, racial ethnic, ethnic minorities have higher risk for cardiometabo cardiometabolic morbidity. So despite the motivation for this research is that despite the significance of um, overuse uh, to our system for uh, both public health and public policy, um, uh, there's little known about its associated factors. Um, and the little evidence then constrains the ability of uh, policymakers to design and implement uh, policies and other strategies to reduce uh, its prevalence. So we had um, a few research questions going into this um, investigation. How prevalent is SGA overuse among publicly insured adults? Does it vary by state? Does it vary by payer? Has prevalence of overuse changed over time? And do patient characteristics matter in terms of overuse? Um, so um, briefly, um, the, uh, our data sources um, include Medicare and uh, Medicaid max data for four states, California, Georgia, Mississippi, and Oklahoma. Uh, this is an adult population. It doesn't include seniors. 
um, and we needed to see that people were filling at least one SGA between uh, fiscal years 08 and 12. Um, and we created uh, payer state cohorts of continuously enrolled adults of white, black, and Latino race ethnicity, uh, uh, where the payers were Medicaid, Medicare, um, and dual uh, payers. Um, we created uh, SGA person month cohorts, essentially looking at utilization um, uh, on a monthly basis. Um, we ascertained diagnosis, um, including, uh, uh, so um, if uh, the person month episode included schizophrenia, bipolar one, or severe psychotic MDD, uh, which is major depressive disorder. Uh, we called it off, uh, on label use, otherwise off label. We had assumed class effects for observed uh, SGAs uh, and conducted person month level analyses by state. Um, the, these, this presentation will focus on the um, uh, outcome, the binary outcome, any use. Uh, we determined off label use rates. Um, on um, uh, 4,000 per person months uh, using direct standardization um, and conducted logistic regression analyses. Let me skip ahead um, to show you some results. Um, so um, we have California, Georgia, Mississippi, and Oklahoma as our states. Uh, you can see that uh, most of our, um, that, that population is middle-aged in their 40s. Um, we had um, uh, 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 predominance of males, uh, sorry, ma uh, females um, in all states but California. Um, we had a fairly substantial number of racial ethnic minorities in California, um, as well as Georgia and Mississippi, um, largely blacks, um, with a number of um, uh, people um, with anxiety, PTSD, OCD, cognitive, and cardiometabolic disorders in our population. Um, and what you, what you can see there is that uh, this is the off-label st status. Um, I'm having trouble doing this. Um, so um, roughly 45% uh, of California um, uh, uh, people um, had, um, were always off-label users with the lowest uh, in um, Georgia with 35%. Uh, this is now looking at uh, person months episodes and what I wanted to uh, focus on here is the off-label percent. So um, highest in California with 42% and lowest in uh, Georgia. Oop. Uh, with 30 percent. Um, the time trends were positive uh, in terms of off-label um, uh, SGA use over time. Uh, all four states had uh, standardized rates going down. Um, and um, the one that started the highest, California, actually had the largest drop. Um, the likelihood of off-label um, uh, SGA use um, is um, something that I wanted to focus on. And um, you can see that, uh, oop, sorry, um, that the largest, um, the largest um, um, likelihood was for Medicaid in the states, the, the two states that had Medicaid beneficiaries, uh, fee-for-service Medicaid beneficiaries middle ground for Medicare and highest um, for, um, sorry, lowest for, uh, of, um, for dual beneficiaries. Um, good news is that minorities um, where um, blacks and Latinos who have a higher uh, risk for um, cardiometabolic, cardiometabolic morbidity um, had lower off-label use, um, but for uh, Oklahoma, I'm gonna to have to race through this now. Um, and um, importantly, uh, we had um, payer effects um, where um, if we looked at race, ethnicity, and off-label use by payer, um, the um, Oklahoma population um, had um, the, 
blacks um, had a higher likelihood of off-label use in Oklahoma uh, for Medicaid uh, beneficiaries. Um, let me sk skip to conclusions. Off-label SGA use is very prevalent, varies by state. Um, it declined, good news. Um, Off-label use was less likely um, among dual beneficiaries and more likely among, among Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, relative to whites, off-label SGA, uh, SG, off SGA use was less likely among black beneficiaries, uh, but with, uh, and with one exception, Latinos, um, and off-label SGA use was less likely if cardiometabolic uh, disorders were present. Um, but our moderator uh, analyses uncovered concerning findings in the sense that in Oklahoma, among dual um, and Medicaid beneficiaries, we actually found that minorities with cardiometabolic morbidity had higher likelihood of off-label SGA use. Um, I didn't cover that very well, but, but that's, I guess, the main point, that even though uh, Lat Latinos and black had lower likelihood of off-label use in one state, they actually had higher likelihood, um, and we're looking into that. Um, questions, hopefully, for the, for the end. Thank you, Marcella. So clearly those with a more rapid speech cadence have an advantage in this game, so <laughs> thank you for being so accommodating. Um, our, um, would you like to get your slides up? So our next speaker will be Elisa Bush. Dr. Bush is from McLean Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and her talk is, her talk is entitled Second Generation Antipsychotic Prescribe prescribing among antipsychotics with varying metabolic risk, patient characteristics, and changes over time in prescribing patterns. Thank you. Good morning. I, as you can see, I shortened my title for the slide. I realized as I was making the slides, it was way too long, and I apologize, <laughs> Susan, for you to go through all that. Uh, so good morning. I'm going to be uh, sharing with you research that I've done with colleagues. I want to um, note my co-investigators. Um, Hayden Huskamp, Vanessa Tsone, and also Sharon Lee Normand. Also thank uh, the pro programming expertise of our colleague Hosina Zini, and certainly our funding from the NIMH. Uh, the, the advantage of being the fourth one is that folks have already, my colleagues have talked about the significance of, uh, of the topic I'm going to bring up, but just to, to highlight, as we've mentioned, individuals with severe mental illness have higher mortality rates, a shorter life expectancy, and that mortality gap has been widening in recent years. Much of the excess mortality is due to medical comorbidity, and second-generation antipsychotics contribute to the increased risk of metabolic syndrome, often uh, defined as a constellation of uh, conditions like hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, diabetes, obesity, um, which is in turn a, a risk for cardiovascular disease. And, um, and this really be became more clinically um, and in the public to some extent widely known in 2004 when the American Psychiatric Association and the American Diabetes Association issued their consensus statement on the risk of second generation antipsychotics. Um, in that consensus statement, this is the risk for metabolic syndrome and cardiovascular disease, and in that consensus statement they stratified the, the second generations into risk, uh, risk categories for uh, cardiovascular metabolic syndrome. Um, and they also recommended metabolic syndrome monitoring guidelines, which a whole slew of research has shown um, since then that we've done a very poor job in adhering to those monitoring guidelines. So I'm going to talk a little bit about second-generation antipsychotics. Um, the first drug was clozapine, introduced in 1990. As uh, Marcella mentioned initially, um, well, they've all been, been FDA approved for schizophrenia, and now some, a subset, have been indicated for bipolar I disorder. Um, and, and uh, some for treatment-resistant depression. But since 2008, we've had generic entry of these medications. Um, the, understandably, the generics are from among the earlier entrants, and they tend to be the medications with the higher metabolic risk. The newer brand drugs are lower risk in, in, this, uh, in, you know, in this side effect, um, but they are more costly. 
So our research questions were in trying to understand whether prescribing patterns for the higher versus lower metabolic risk medications, were they changing over time? And are there patient characteristics associated with, with difference in, um, in this prescribe? If there are differences in prescribing, um, you know, does it vary by patient characteristics, both clinical and, and demographic, among patients with psychotic disorders? So here's, here's the playing field of the antipsychotics that um, were available during our study period. And I've broken these down into a uh, risk category, which is actually borrowed from UpToDate, the sort of clinical review service. In 2017, they updated their list. The 2004 APA and ADA consensus guidelines were too outdated for us to use. You know, there have been uh, several more medications on the market. So we borrowed from the UpToDate. Um, and you can see that, so we have the year on market and the year of generic entry when there was generic entry. We collapse these four categories of risk with, with higher number being higher metabolic risk into three, low, moderate, and high. And we did this because in earlier runs of our data, we saw that there, that there oh, sorry, I could never get those little red boxes to line up. Um, that uh, we, because we saw in looking at earlier runs of our data that that there wasn't really, frankly, a high prevalence of those you know, one and two risk category medications. So we collapsed them into what we call a lower uh, metabolic risk set, and then the moderates and the high. And I think it's worth noting a couple of things from this, this table. One is that the highest metabolic risk are olanzapine and clozapine. Um, and among the lower metabolic risk, the only one to go on market during our study period, which goes up through 2015, well, there were two. There is a prazodone, which has never really been a, a strong entrant in the market, um, and then aripiprazole towards the end of our study within the last year, so not even 12 months of data, um, aripiprazole was, uh, was generic. This is an observational study. We had a 100% 100% fee for service national Medicare claims data sample. Our data years for, were from 2005 to 2015. Uh, our our study sample were the Medicare beneficiaries who were diagnosed with psychotic disorder who were under age 65. These were individuals with schizophrenia, bipolar one disorder, or major depression with psychotic features, and they had to have filled at least one prescription for a second generation oral antipsychotic in a year. We fit a logistic regression model where we linked the prescription fill of uh, higher versus, it really should be uh, the comparison, it was one model, it was comparison of higher versus lower risk and moderate versus lower risk, second generation antipsychotics to the patient demographic and clinical characteristics we examined. And then we ran a sensitivity analysis where we re-ran the model with alclozapine. And that's because if you go back to our list here, category four is only consists of clozapine and olanzapine. And clozapine really has a, a special role in our armamentarium um, in that it is FDA indicated for individuals with treatment resistant um, schizophrenia. And so we wanted to see if we you know, took out that special sort of medication, which may be a medication of last resort for some people. Did that change our, our results? Uh, in the model, it was, as I mentioned, one one model, um, but it was a comparison of uh, being prescribed a higher versus lower metabolic risk medication or a moderate versus lower metabolic risk medication. And included in the, in the model were the explanatory variables for a uh, year, the usual demographics that are available in claims data, uh, also U.S. region, and we included a few clinical characteristics, whether or not an individual had at least one mental health hospitalization or ER visit in the year. Um, by the by the start of, meaning prior to the claims year of that prescription fill from the chronic condition warehouse in the Medicare data, we looked at whether there was at least one of the metabolic conditions present, um, whether someone already had cardiovascular disease. And also we looked at whether there was a co-occurring dementia diagnosis, because um, although for, you know, for individuals who already have a psychotic disorder, it's not contraindicated to prescribe an antipsychotic, it is a little complicating, right? because we know that antipsychotics in individuals with dementia, that there's a higher risk of, of sudden death. And there's no, although there's no one antipsychotic that is safer than another for this purpose, um, we know, number one, that individuals with, uh, with psychotic disorders are at higher risk for dementia, um, and, I, and we also thought, we thought this was, uh, this was a complicating, uh, di compl complicating co-occurring illness. And, um, and although, as I, I just mentioned a moment ago, there's no, no one medication that's sort of better or worse among the antipsychotics, um, at least in my review of the literature, I didn't find any of the newer lower metabolic risk medications studied. So, you know, to us it was a little bit of an open question 
um, you know, m might having a co-occurring dementia influence at all uh, the, the risk profile, metabolic risk profile of the medication prescribed. And then we were also curious to see if the prescriber was a psychiatrist or not, you know, was that associated with uh, differences in prescribing according to metabolic risk. So these are the unadjusted results. You can get a sense of our, our population. We had over four, four million person years of, of data. Um, and the population was predominantly between ages 45 and 64, it was, uh, nearly 64 uh, percent. Forty, nearly 49 percent were male, predominantly white, 74.8 percent, and predominantly from the south, 40.6 percent, and 28 percent from the northeast. In terms of the clinical characteristics, 17.8% uh, uh, of the person, these are person years, uh, had a, a hospitalization, 51% uh, uh, included at least one metabolic condition, uh, nearly 25% cardiovascular disease, 86.6% of psychiatrist prescribers, so a lot of psychiatrist prescribers, not surprisingly, and 9.4% uh, had a co-occurring dementia. Here now we come into the adjusted uh, results, and so this is the time trend. And um, you know we've got like over four million person years, so there's a lot of data. And so there's, you'll see uh, there's there you know certainly we have the power to you know to find statistically significant differences, which may not be of much clinical or policy uh, implication. But we did find that over time, when you compare prescribing of moderate to lower risk medications, uh, there was a, a slight decrease you know relative to pr being prescribed lower risk, so meaning more lower risk. Uh, prescribed over time when you compare it to the moderate risk, um, and, and then even a smaller change, <laughs> you know, but in the opposite direction of the comparison of higher versus lower risk. Um, again, like I don't think this is of much clinical or policy uh, significance, but they are statistically significant and do show a different directionality. And then here are the, the demographic characteristics, and the, the, the trends that you can see are, I mean, in general, everything is associated uh, just about everything was statistically significant. Um, it, older age was associated with being prescribed um, moderate compared to lower risk medications and also um, higher compared to lower uh, metabolic risk medications. Um, and the strength or the, you know, the odds ratios were higher um, when, you, when you are comparing higher versus lower risk. Um, also, males were more likely um, to receive moderate versus lower risk or higher versus lower risk antipsychotics. Um, and we did see some race and ethnicity uh, differences. Uh, blacks were more likely to be prescribed moderate compared to lower risk medications, slightly less likely to, re to receive higher versus lower risk um, medications. Um, you know, also in terms of, of other uh, uh, racial and um, ethnic comparisons, moderate versus lower risk was a little bit higher compared to whites. Um, I, I don't really know what to make, to be honest, of these, you know, findings that we have. They're, they're a little bit mixed, um, but, uh, but a, a, a bit of a, a, a lower odds for higher compared to lower risk among uh, Hispanics and uh, higher odds uh, in the other category. And I should say that I mentioned earlier we took out clozapine as a sensitivity analysis. None of the results qualitatively changed except for, uh, unfortunately, when we took out clozapine, we found that, that blacks were now more likely to receive higher um, instead of lower metabolic risk medications, um, which means they were a lot less likely to receive, you know, it was clozapine that made the difference. They were much less likely to receive clozapine. And so we took that out of the model that it changed the results changed. Um, there were some regional differences as well. Uh, the reference is, is the South. I'm just going to move on to the clinical because I have two minutes. Um, and in terms of the clinical characteristics, again, you know, to me there were some surprises. Uh, the higher odds of receiving the moderate or higher risk medications if you had a mental health hospitalization in that year. Surprisingly, the metabol if you had a metabolic condition or cardiovascular disease, you were still more likely to receive um, the sort of the, the, the higher and moderate risk medications, psychiatrist prescriber, more, you were more likely, and uh, also dementia diagnosis. And as I mentioned, you know, I wasn't sure what to expect from the dementia diagnosis. It complicates things, um, but it's like everything is going in the same direction with the clinical characteristics, regardless of what one might think. So in conclusion, we found there wasn't really much going on in terms of prescribing changes over time. We found some patient characteristics were associated um, with prescribing of, you know, according to metabolic risk, notably, you know, age um, and the racial disparities that I, I mentioned, uh, particularly for blacks. Uh, the clinical characteristics were all associated with higher or moderate risk medication prescribing relative to lower, <laughs> bless you. 
Um, even those for which there, the there was a clinical rationale would suggest that it would be better to prescribe a lower risk medication or that would be appropriate certainly, and also when there wasn't a clear rationale. We saw it all, you know, going in that direction. Oops, sorry. So, you know, as I thought about these results, really to me, I think that, the, you know, the important takeaway from the thinking through this for both policy implications and next steps is the role of Part D medication plan management um, in, in what's going on with prescribing. And as you recall from this table, you know, the entry of generic versus branded drugs is, you know, it's pretty consistent that the, that the higher metabolic risk drugs are the ones that are going on generic entry, you know, firmly during the study period. Um, and although antipsychotics are a protected class in Medicare, uh, the, the uh, pharmacy management uh, companies, you know, the plans can still certainly manage the benefit through, pr you know, prior authorization um, and other kinds of strategies. So I think that, um, that that's really an important set of next steps to understand. Uh, so the limitations of this study are, uh, this is an observational study, so we can't really speak about causality. These are claims data, they're limited in clinical detail. And I think it's important also to consider that metabolic and cardiovascular risk is, th they are one of several clinical considerations uh, that one thinks of when selecting second generation antipsychotics. Um, and so it could be that other clinical, um, you know, really side effect profiles or situations were prevailing in some of these decisions. I unfortunately, we don't have data on the Part D antipsychotic coverage restrictions, um, and we have limited prescriber information. But I think, you know, nonetheless, it, it just to me, it was really striking to see that, that you know, despite these, uh, all the, the influx of new medications and the concerns, you know, about how they might be breaking the bank, they're not, you know, it seems like the sucking sound is going <laughs> towards the generics in terms of the prescribing. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. And our next presenter is Dr. Min Young Kim from Cornell Medical College, and his talk is entitled Association Networks of Chronic Medical Conditions with Depression in Male and Female Population. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's my great, great pleasure uh, to talk about my work, Association Networks of Chronic Medical Conditions in de with Depression in Male and Female Population. I'm Min Young Kim. Uh, I'm a fellow in healthcare policy and research in the Division of Health Informatics at Weill Cornell. Uh, so as previous speakers explained, uh, depression and many som somatic medical conditions are associated uh, and there are known by directional causality. Uh, it is natural to expect that physical burden may affect mental burden. Sorry. And also, uh, psychological factors affect medical condition, uh, such as through health related lifestyles, doctor patient relationships, compliance to the treatment and also as previous speakers explained from secondary adverse effects of some psychiatric medication. And methodology wise, I have been working on modeling uh, complex relationships with network theoretic approaches, hoping for more systematic and compre comprehensive knowledge representation. So perhaps this might be too ambitious goal, which may not be well accepted at the moment, but in my view, a potential advantage of data-driven method to synthesize the evidence involving multiple relationship is a, a potential advantage. 
So in this slide, I wanted to contrast data-driven methods to meta-analysis, which would be a, a kind of gold standard method of synthesizing evidence for the association between multiple enti entities using uh, aggregate average and variance estimates published in the literature. However, this is there is a known limitation if there are heterogeneity and inconsistency in the adjustment of confounding factors in each studies they are going to aggregate because each research is each uh, study will have different data components different research designs so so that might limit the validity of the meta analysis and given that depression is associated with various non-medical factors and various confounders, uh, this might uh, more limit the, the validity of meta-analysis in depression. I know this might be a very ambitious statement, but uh, my hope is that uh, by uh, this kind, using these kind of methods, uh, I might uh, lead to uh, what is called distributed learning or federated learning, which is learning by individual individual level data stored in multiple databases. I have uh, elaborated on refining my research questions and hypothesis. Uh, in terms of network analysis, the research question would be written as the number one. Does MDD position itself within the association network of chronic conditions differentially in male versus female population? Or can we assess through the association network constructed separately in male versus female population? And can we evaluate the rewire metric? Uh, to make this align more with a traditional statistical null hypothesis testing problem, uh, I've also written the number two. Are the association between depression and medical conditions differential in male versus female population? Which might be not exactly the same as number one, but I thought this could be the way I can align with statistical null hypothesis testing. But this will be, in terms of that, this will be a multiple comparison problem, and I have to adjust for a first discovery rate. So this is written as uh, uh, for each chronic conditions. Null hypothesis is that uh, in male subpopulation, the correlation estimated correlation coefficient between MDD and the chronic condition is not statistically significantly different from that within a female subpopulation. In terms of study design, uh, uh, I elaborated with particularly for the operational definition or phenotyping of MDD cases to minimize the limitation of using routinely, routinely collected administrative healthcare data. So, uh, so the first line, new diagnosis of MDD with no prior record of MDD diagnosis for at least five years. This was because it, it is known that depression patients have the prodromal uh, symptoms many years prior to the diagnosis and uh, temporary relationship between the, the entities are kind of important component of causal inference and uh, confounding. So I, I, I defined as five years and uh, at least twice the diagnosis recorded, prescribed antidepressants, no prior diagnosis of either bipolar or schizophrenia. These are all to minimize 
uh, false positive rate of the operational definition itself. And for the control, I, I used nest match, matched controls with incidence density sampling, which is uh, selecting among those who are at risk of be becoming ca cases, I am selecting for each time point when uh, nested cases was defined, uh, I am matching at that time point uh, matched control. And I match by, based on demographic profile, socioeconomic status, insurance status, geographical locations, and health services utilization. And for this study, I used uh, a uh, data source from Korea National Health Insurance Services. It is, uh, it makes me easier uh, and it will be an uh, exceptional advantage using this data is that it is universal healthcare system with a single pay payer health system. And the sampling scheme is randomized over the official national identifier. So we can apply the theories of statistical inference without additional uh, assumptions. And uh, so that's why I use this data source. And for multiple uh, medical, somatic medical conditions, I used the chronic conditions data warehouse condition algorithm by CMS. I used 15 chronic medical condition categories except some of the, the uh, uh, less relevant to this study. So these, those are anemia, arthritis, asthma, cataract, chronic kidney disease, COPD, diabetes, dementia, hyperlipidemia, heart failure, hypothyroidism, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, osteoporosis, and stroke. And uh, briefly, uh, the analytic method is first association network is constructed uh, with uh, some, some traditional method in this area using correlation coefficients as weight. This is briefly its first directed algorithm using weights of edges as attractive forces, such as theories in physics until the, the, the the distance reach the equilibrium. And uh, closer distance within the network implies higher edge weight and higher correlation coefficient between the linked ent entities. And the rewire metric is uh, more, more of traditional statistical method. Uh, it's essentially uh, null hypothesis statistical testing for the difference in correlation uh, using some kind of transformation to make it make the difference uh, follow a normal distribution. So this is uh, well, this is the result, and uh, a challenge will be uh, so how to interpret this. I constructed the network. How I constructed. Uh, interpret that it is actually a little bit challenge, but this is this is related to my research question number one, which I told you that does MDD position itself within the association network of chronic uh, conditions differentially in male versus female population, and the orange arrow indicates the position of MDD here, and another here. So MDD does position itself within almost in the middle of multiple network of chronic medical conditions. But uh, there, there is, uh, to my knowledge, there is no way to test that kind of hypothesis in terms of neural hypothesis testing. So it can be just visualized in this way. And the blue color and Red color, blue color indicates the, based on the rewire metric, the correlation coefficients are significantly higher in male population. Female means that uh, uh, significantly higher in female population. So there are some edges I color to represent the, based on the 
statistical hypothesis testing, it is the difference is significant, but none of the edges involving the actual MDD was colored in this graph because it was not significant. So in the above the previous graph, the pairwise correlation higher in males was asthma COPD, or I think this is a typo, sorry, but cataract hypothyroidism, CKD, and stroke. And the, the pairwise correlation higher in female were arthritis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, osteoporosis, arthritis, diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis. And these are the correlation coefficients. But our results show that the association between depression and other chronic conditions were not significant after accounting for multiple comparison, which is this null hypothesis I written as in the most uh, lower part, which was my second research question. So uh, the discussion, what is the meaning of these findings? So I written, I've, written, I, I've written down in English language and also in equation, but I think when the association involves three entities, the, the English language beco become very confusing and vague. But if I were to write down in English sentence, it is written as follows. Although the depression itself is well known to be associated with female sex, the association between depression and Other chronic conditions were not significantly different in males versus females. Or in other words, uh, sorry. Or in other words, uh, gender may not have a significant interaction rather than its main effect. Or in other words, gender may not be an effect modifier although it may be a confounder. So that is my uh, uh, finding. However, this is the finding, but this does not mean that uh, chronic conditions are not important in modeling in both male versus female, and female should be included in the multidimensional model. This is, that is bullet point two. So, because given that many of the chronic conditions co-occur in females, it may also contribute to depression in proportion of the, to the co-occurrence, albeit the same gradient, which, which the same sentence could be written in the below formula. Sorry. So, on ongoing research, I, I am trying to expand this in a matched case control design to uh, apply to more uh, non-biased uh, bias sample. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge uh, this is uh, partially funded from NIMH, I, I think, and I also got funding from uh, Korea uh, National Research Foundation. And these are the reference. Thank you so much. Thank you, Min Young. And thank you to our panelists for five excellent presentations. And thank you to our audience for your attention. Um, I, I think we're pretty much out of time, but um, would our uh, panelists um, have a few minutes um, for folks um, uh, who want to come up and, and talk with you? Yes, okay. <laughs> They're making themselves available to you. Well, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Okay. <laughs>